I'm Rahul Chakra. I'm from the Frankfurt and Brussels Parish. And uh, actually, I'll start, talk, before I talk about the future, let me start with the past. Two decades back, I was in Brussels as part of the digital team, the first digital team set up by PNG to understand this thing called internet and digital stuff that was going to impact the business. And part of my job was to evangelize digital. So I used to go to different organizations within Europe and talk about digital technologies, etc. And we used to have scenarios where digital companies could become retailers, could become competitors, uh, could become bankers. I don't think anyone within the audience believed us. <laughs> I don't think so. And to be honest, even we could not imagine how deep and how pervasive digital has become in our lives, in our communities, and in our politics. And I couldn't imagine that two decades later, I would be standing in front of PNG alumnus and talking about artificial intelligence uh, to an audience who most probably would not believe that also. So let me first start with describing what artificial intelligence is. Actually, there is no single definition, description of AI. So I've tried three different descriptions. Each one is not perfect by itself, but together they kind of give you a taste of what, of what AI is. So the simplest one, AI systems, and when I take systems, it's normally about software. AI systems do job, complex tasks that you would normally associate with human intelligence like translating a language, recognizing a picture, etc. The second definition, second description is a, a slightly more technical. Now, when we use technology, especially digital technology, the technology has a logic behind it, which says, if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. Now, in the current technology, that logic is defined by human beings. If a business analyst or someone sits and says, this is the logic of the system, and the programmer then translates that logic into a software program, and that's how all our systems work, from the computers to for PowerPoints, etc. The key paradigm shift, and this is a very important paradigm shift, is in the AI systems, the systems look at facts, look at data, and then create the logic. Now, this is what is called machine learning, which George briefly alluded to. In the first paradigm, where we write the logic, the challenge is it can do most stuff, but it cannot resolve some complex tasks. And when there are some complex tasks that, like that, we put a human in the middle. Like, for example, looking at a scan and seeing whether that tumor is malignant or not, we usually have a doctor. Or to look at an email that your customer support receives and say, see whether that's a complaint or a compliment, you usually have an agent. In the AI systems, the AI systems look at the data and create their own logic. This is a key paradigm shift. And that is why this is a machine learning, and that is why data becomes very important in the world of AI. Because if the data is wrong, the logic is wrong. If the data is biased, the logic is biased. The third description is the AI system, just like children, just like humans, continues to learn. As it, we use it more and more, it gets better. Yeah. So together, we have these three definitions together. is a reasonable explanation of what an AI system is. Now, the question is, AI has been there for a long time. It's a very old science. So the question becomes, why are we talking about AI now? If you look at this graph, AI has been a computer science discipline since 1950s. John McCarthy, a computer scientist, actually came up with the word uh, artificial intelligence. And there are multiple reasons why in this decade, 
we suddenly are talking about AI. Reason number one, computers are powerful. Because in order to do AI, in order to process all the data, you need some serious computing power. And today, this decade, we suddenly have some serious computing power available to everyone. You need some large amounts of data sets. And with the availability of sensors, etc., data sets are available in the world, available for everyone. In fact, one of the most interesting bit is in 2010, a group in Stanford made available a million images, properly labeled, made available to everyone. Basically, you could create your own systems and test it against this uh, a million images and see whether the, your system is actually good or not. Third is the science called deep learning which is a subset of machine learning. It used to be a niche sport. People have been doing deep learning for a long time. Deep learning used to be called neural networks. Effectively, what, basically what it is, is it tries to mim mimic what, how our brains operate. And people have been doing it for a long time. It wasn't getting anywhere. Then last decade, someone came up with a couple of little changes, and suddenly, you found that deep learning could resolve some fundamental problems. And in 2010, I talked about the availability of a million images. The group that made it available also started a contest saying, can you build a system that can actually recognize these images accurately? In the first year, the error rate was 28%. In the second year, it was around 26%. Then a group using deep learning came up in 2012, and the error rate dropped to 15.3%. When that happened, people said, ah, something has changed. So 2012 was the breakthrough year for AI. It's when AI 2.0 was born. It's a relatively new science, seven years old. Then in 2015, something happened, another milestone. Can anyone take a guess? What? The cat. No. Something else. He's going to drink some water while I'm talking about it. It's AlphaGo. Go is the game which is considered one of the most complex games, much more complex than chess. Sorry? Go. It's an Asian game. What's it? No. Yeah. It is, um, I don't know, I've never played it, so I don't know how to describe it. We can do that. I'm sure someone here knows to play Get Go, Game Go or has played it and could describe it. But it's supposed to be a very complex game, a million times more complex than chess. And no one thought anyone could beat a Go player. And a company in London, DeepMind, actually created this product, uh, the system called AlphaGo, and started beating professional Go players without any handicap for the first time in 2015, four years back, just four years back. And that's when suddenly people go, hang on, this AI is real. It's solving some serious big problems. This is going to change the world. And suddenly money started pouring in into the field of AI, just four years back. And more important, people started getting seriously ambitious about what you could do with this technology. Google and other companies started coming up with the idea of self-driving cars, which was considered impossible a few years back. And then, so that's when deep learning and AI 2.0 took off. So, very, very young science, what can it do? I'll just talk about three capabilities. The most one, uh, common one are the ones that are powered by deep learning. I've given a few examples, but what deep learning can do is, number one, predict. What deep learning does is look at a, you know, millions of data points, finds patterns in it by itself, 
patterns that human beings, you and me, cannot find, finds pattern, find patterns in it, and based on that pattern, is able to predict what's going to happen next in real time, because it can process all this data. It can then classify, and it can also optimize. So prediction means someone like a, uh, for example, I met a uh, company a couple of weeks back in London. They use deep learning to predict foreign exchange movements to the ninth decimal. And to the ninth de decimal in nanoseconds, they go in and out, and they make very hefty returns. Okay. So if someone's got money and want to make a lot of money, that's an area to actually invest in. Classification. You look at an email, emails come in. Some of them are fraud, some of them are phishing emails, some of them are real emails, some of them are spam. Deep learning-based systems can easily uh, classify them. Actually, you might have noticed within your Gmail, etc., your spam uh, filtering has got really good. It used to be pretty crap earlier on. Then you can actually optimize. For example, in the supply chain, you have millions of data points. I would guess 90, 95% of the company's supply chains are very inefficient. Using deep learning, using all those data points, you could reduce this cost substantially and improve the customer experience. Some companies are starting to do it. Walmart is actually ahead of the game in this. Uh, they have uh, AI, I think they have around 1,500 data scientists, a lot of them based on the West, side, uh, West Coast, that take data points from all the suppliers and all the trucks, everything, and they optimize the supply chain. There are some other uh, examples of how deep learning can be used. The second capability, image recognition. You, you know, this comes into the news quite often. Image recognition actually has become really good. Um, and videos, which is basically images, like quite a few frames per second, vi vi recognizing videos also has become really good, that it's almost a commodity. In fact, there are tools available off the shelf. There are even free tools available. You could start today, this morning, and by this evening, you could actually have a decent image recognition system for you ready. And it's been used in multiple areas. Besides security, etc. it's been used, for example, in uh, maintenance, reaching, looking after parts, components, for example, in oil and natural gas, and recognizing what's going to go wrong, what's, and predicting what's going to go wrong very easily. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's used a lot increasingly in senior citizens' home, etc., to predict, to understand what's going, what's going on there, what's going to happen, and based on that, make an intervention. The third capability, interesting one, is language. Again, you know, 10 years back, language was considered a human capability. Machines couldn't handle it. Today, understanding language, processing language, has got really good. I mean, you use it almost pretty much every day, every week. Translations, Facebook translation, Google translation, all powered by AI. AI it's used for in legal, some legal firms have started using for summarizing legal documents. And uh, for actually doing due diligence. We are using, with some of our customers, for uh, processing customer conversations. One of the interesting bit of, uh, is that people have been talking back to brands, which was initially every brand went, Yahoo, we can actually talk to our customers, which is good. They started putting agents to talk back to the customers, but customers started talking more and more and more with more channels, and nowadays most brands have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of conversations, and they're not able to meet that using agents. And what happens is issues that are being flagged by agents fall behind until something goes wrong, and then the CEO says, did we know about this? Then they start looking at the customer conversations and figure out actually we knew about it three months back. We just didn't process it. So we are working with some of our customers to actually automate that conversation, processing of the co understanding and processing of the conversation. Now, I talk about processing of language. Generation of language is much more difficult. It's being done in very specific, narrow areas. But general conversation is far away. And uh, there are a lot of fake 
AI systems that pretend to have a conversation. Usually, there's a human being in the middle faking it. So where are we using AI? There are some sectors that are ahead of the game. If you work in any of these sectors, you would know about it. I'll just point out two. Health is a place where, which has really adopted AI. It's uh, drug discovery. The speed of drug discovery has, is being transformed. It's also being used in, on a day-to-day -day health. Uh, for example, in UK, breast cancer screening is done. The scan is looked by two doctors. There are two problems with that. One is there's a high degree of false positives. Number two, UK has a shortage of radiologists, so there are not enough doctors to actually look at scans. So for the first time, the health system in UK has is started to incorporate AI. So you have one doctor and one AI system looking at a scan. To, um, so this is the... I'm really happy about it because this is the first time the health system has started using AI into that because the health system is full of data and it needs automation. Uh, other one which might surprise some of you is local government. Local government is full of data, again, has the same problem, shortage of resources. There's some really smart thinking going on local government about using uh, AI to protect against fraud, but also, more importantly, to predict what's going to happen so they can optimize their resources. So you might ask, if I'm not in any of these sectors, actually, if, you are, if I'm in any of these sectors, I better be using AI. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention on the health side, the interesting thing about health is most of the innovation, AI-based innovation, is being done by big tech companies and startups, not the big pharma companies that you would expect to do. So I think that's going to happen in many other sectors. So even if you're not in any of the sectors, you could actually, there's still plenty of opportunity to use AI in day-to-day -day work across the spectrum. You can use AI to improve your financial forecasting. In fact, you can go from quarterly forecasting to day-to-day -to -day forecasting, real-time forecasting. You can use it for predictive maintenance. We work with a lot of customers in improving retention because we can actually predict by individual customer who's, going to likely, who's likely to leave and why they're likely to leave and reduce the retention, uh, sorry, increase the retention, reduce the churn. So that's about AI. So it's, uh, sorry, that's a very quick tour about AI. And summary of that bit is if you're not using, your business is not using AI, I think you should think about starting to use, at least dipping your toes within the next 12 to 24 months. Because I can guarantee you, if you don't do that, you're opening up a competitive space for someone else are of complete new company because AI offers capability to completely transform parts of your organization, but also more importantly, what you do and how you do it. So if you wanted to, how would you start? I would say you've got to make three plus one decision. The three decision is number one, have a very clear objective with a reasonable, okay? <laughs> I could have predicted that. <laughs> Um, with a reasonable objective, which is, uh, when I say reasonable, you can't go like reduce my cost by 90%, because you, you can have that objective, but it will take you two or three years to actually build an AI system that can help you do that. But if you say reduce my cost by 25%, you could have an AI system ready in three to four months. Data strategy. Now, most companies will, tell you, will say that I don't have data. I would argue, Every company has zillions of data. You just don't know where it is. And most likely, 80 to 90% of the data is not being used. And in fact, every conversation I have with a prospect or a customer is usually first part is spent about identifying data, where the data is, getting the data, and accessing the data. Have a data strategy that is going to help the objective. Third, decide how you're going to do the AI. Are you going to build internal capabilities, which is what everyone starts with? 
uh, or are you work with someone else? Because building internal capabilities is a tough, costly prospect. You have to ask yourself, am I able to attract good AI engineers? And there's a big difference between good, AI, good and experienced AI engineers and AI engineers. Or am I going to work with someone else? Or if, even if I'm able to attract, can I keep them? The plus one is, as usual with any change, there's a minority in your organization who will be adventurous to actually take the step, experiment, and be ready to fail if necessary. You have to allow them to fail. But there will be a majority who will be resistant to change. So the ch question you have to ask is, how are you going to work with the majority? How are you going to make the change happen? So as a summary, I hope I just gave you a very quick flavor of what AI is. I hope I was able to say that this is a genuine paradigm shift in technology and the way we run our businesses. It is going to help all of us to address some of the very complex, complex tasks that we were not able to deal with before. It is going to help us make our businesses more productive, more efficient. It is, I, I would say, improve the overall quality of life. Now, there are a lot of challenges and risks that I have not even talked to. Challenges about bias, challenges about transparency, tra challenges about accountability, etc. Uh, that's going to take another hour or two. But these are challenges. But I'm confident that we, are, we will be able to mitigate these challenges because we know about it right now. It, it's not going to come as a surprise. One last point about general intelligence. Everything that I have talked about, everything that I've spoken, every example I've given, is very narrow, specific to one single task, one domain, etc. That is very different from general intelligence. General intelligence means you're able to do, a system is able to do any task that a human being can do, any task. We are far away from there. That's what I say now. Hopefully, maybe, I would say three to four decades. I think George said 2045, singularity. Uh, who knows, maybe in a decade or two, someone else is going to be standing here and say, hey guys, we've got general intelligence. I look forward to that day. Thank you.